Hey everybody, thanks again for allowing me to speak. Um, If you have your Bibles with you, we're going to be in the book of Exodus, chapter 3. That's the second book in the Bible, right after Genesis. And just a little side note, the Exodus story is probably my favorite story in all of the Bible. Mm. And hopefully someday I'll be able to tell you why. But, uh, But I just really, really love the Exodus story. Um, And we're going to start in Exodus chapter 3, and the title of my message is No More Excuses. Mm -hmm. So, starting at verse 1, it says, Meanwhile, Moses was shepherding the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire within a bush. As Moses looked, he saw that the bush was on fire, but it was not consumed. So Moses thought, I must go over and look at this remarkable sight. Why isn't this bush burning up? When the Lord saw that he had uh, gone over to look, God called out to him from the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, he answered. Do not come closer, he said. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he continued, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people in Egypt and have heard them crying out because of their oppressors. I know about their sufferings, and I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians to bring them from the land to a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. The territory of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, uh, Perizzites, Hivites, and uh, Jebusites, Gazuntite. So because the Israelites cry out for help has, has come to me, and I have also seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. Therefore, go. I am sending you to them, to to Pharaoh, so that you may lead my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses asked God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He answered, I will certainly be with you. And this will be a sign to you that I am the one who sent you when you bring the people out of Egypt. You will all worship God at this mountain. And so uh, in our text, Moses and God are having this remarkable conversation. Um, And it it goes clear through chapter 4. And some 40 years earlier, uh, Moses would have been considered royalty. And as a young man, he had everything. And then he murders an Egyptian man and he flees for 40 years in the wilderness. And he, he, he's there for 40 years. After 40 years, Moses has this radical encounter with God, where God calls Moses to be the deliverer of, of, of the Israelites out, out, of, out of Egypt. And of course, Moses is hesitant. Uh, uh, scholars tell us that he, he led some 2.5 million people out of Egypt into the promised land. And, uh, and of course, he, he was hesitant. But I just want to let you know that when God calls you to something, it's always going to be an impossible task, mm-hmm. something that you cannot do on your own. And upon hearing this, Moses starts to make excuses as to why he couldn't say yes to what God wanted him to do. And let, let's take a look at, at, some of the, at some of what this dialogue between Moses and God is. Because we can make a parallel today that many Christians are making excuses as to why they can't fulfill the call on their life. So we see that the, that the first excuse that, that Moses makes is, uh, who am I? Or 
In other words, he's saying, I'm unqualified. He says, God, I'm unqualified to do what you've called me to do. And so what had happened was 40 years in the wilderness had stripped Moses of his pride. And now he was a humble old man. Um, and, uh, and so, but that is exactly where God wanted him to be. He wanted him to be stripped of his pride uh, so that he could be used. God cannot and will not use someone who is full of themselves. They have to be full of the Spirit of God. And God's reply, uh, he says, I will certainly be with you. And uh, it's, it's intended to take Moses' focus off of himself and focus on where he should be, and that, that's on God. And so... Uh, True humility, though, is not like a, a downward look upon ourselves. It's, it's, it's more of a, a, right, um, a right reflection of ourselves as God sees us. And so finally, we see Moses, he, he reluctantly agrees to do what God says. But then he asks, who should I say has sent me? And God says, I am who I am. I am Yahweh. And uh, he, he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. Um, and you might be in the same place as Moses is right now. You might be saying, who am I to be to be doing this? I'm, I'm not qualified to do what you, you're telling me to do. Um, but God is saying, I am who I am, and whatever God has called you to do, whatever you're not, he's going to fill in the gaps because he is. He's the I am. Uh, no more excuses. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 24, tells us, He who has called you is faithful, and who will also do it. He doesn't call the qualified, as it's often said, but he qualifies the called. And so, secondly, we see uh, Moses' second excuse is, but God, they won't, they won't listen. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 18, God promised that the leaders of Israel would listen to Moses. Um, he said, they will heed your voice. And when Moses made this protest uh, that, that they wouldn't listen, he's like, yeah, but God, what if you're wrong about, about that? In his first excuse, Moses wasn't confident in himself, and now he's showing that he's not confident in God. That's, that's, he's, go, he's going in a downward spiral. Um, and, and, and he even he, he said this even after God gave Moses all these signs uh, that uh, that it was going to be OK. It was going to work out. And, and he still didn't trust it. So when Christians fail to trust God, demanding assurance from God, um, despite of what God has already spoken, you might lose out on opportunities. Uh, and so when we fail to trust God, we are basically saying that the all-powerful, all-knowing, always-present God is not enough. So let me ask you, what areas of your life are you not trusting God in? Uh, even though... God has already given you signs and affirmation on, on what he's called you to do. All you have to do is, is trust it. Uh, Psalms 20 verse 7 says, Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. And Jeremiah 
takes this uh, a step further. He, he takes a little bit of a more stern turn. I just realized that rhymed. But uh, Jeremiah <laughs> chapter 17, verse 5 says, uh, Thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes his flesh his strength, wow. whose heart turns away from God. Let me just tell you, God is always present, all-knowing, and all-powerful. There is nothing, nothing in your life that you cannot trust in Him. And if God says you're going to do something, you're going to do it. All you have to do is say, yes, you know, they, you are qualified because He's the one that qualifies you. Um, they will listen to you. Or, or, or whatever the, the implication may be, because God has already confirmed to you that it's going to happen. But lastly, I, I really want you to pay special attention to this. He, he, he used his physical limitations as an excuse. Exodus chapter 4, uh, verse, verse 10 through 12. And uh, th this, is a, this is something that is very near and dear to my, to my heart. And I want to try to convey this as best as possible. This is his, 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 his second to last final excuse that he uses. He says, But Moses replied to the Lord, Please, Lord, I have never been eloquent, either in past or recently, or since you have been speaking to your servant, because my mouth and my tongue are sluggish. The Lord said to him, Who placed a mouth on humans? And, uh, and who, uh, may, who, who makes a person mute or deaf, seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Wow. And so, I, I find that I find that interesting because in Acts chapter seven verse twenty two, it tells us that Moses was learned in all wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. So, I'm honestly I I couldn't tell you what happened over time, but something must have happened in his time during the wilderness, where he was not um, as uh, an effective communicator as it used to be, and it actually, actually became some uh, sort of a, a handicap uh, to him. And so uh, with the time I have left, I, I just want to share with you th this, that, you know, we all have limitations in our lives, in some way, shape, or form. Uh, I, was, I was born uh, four months early, and I was diagnosed with cerebral palsy. And uh, basically, what that is, is uh, it's, it's a condition where your brain and your muscles argue with each other, and, and it could make moving a little bit difficult. And the, the circumstances surrounding that, uh, my doctors told my parents that I would never uh, walk, I would never talk, that I would be a vegetable in a wheelchair my whole life. Um, and well, now you know by looking at me, that's not exactly what happened. God, but uh, yeah. but uh, God had other plans, and so. But but you could you could imagine that um, that having that sort of prognosis uh, was scary. But I'm very thankful that my parents were. Uh, they did not take no for an answer. They yes, advocated so. for me. They, yes, they so. did all these things. And um, I was involved in uh, physical therapy, speech therapy, occupational therapy, anything that you can think of. Ironically enough, my, my speech therapist's name was Mrs. Walkenschwanz. <laughs> oh. <Yeah. laughs> oh goodness! <laughs> yeah. So so. Uh, oh. she, yeah. So she had this running joke that if you could say her name without messing up, you don't need speech therapy. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, but you know what? I, I undergoing all that. I, I started using a walker to get around at first, and then I, I was undergoing what are called Botox injections. 
And uh, basically what those are, as you've probably heard, that women sometimes get those to look a few years younger. Um, if you do that, I might think you're crazy because what they would do in my case is they would take a needle that was very long and they would jam it into my calf muscle. And after that, they, would, they wouldn't they would stop there. They would dig it around when the needle was in my leg mm. to, to inject the medication. Mm. So long story short, uh, after those therapies and uh, a surgery, I was able to, to walk on my own without any, uh, any assistance. But uh, so as, as I grew up, you know, I participated in sports and things like that. And uh, uh, I, uh, I, I loved wrestling. I, I wasn't very successful in it, but it gave me the opportunity. I had the opportunity to share uh, my story on a um, on a local news channel, and eventually ESPN wanted to pick me up on that, and I said absolutely, but that opportunity fell through. And uh, but I, I I'm telling you all this to say. Um, when I graduated high school, I was dead set. I was telling the story last night. I was dead set on being a, a physical therapist because I wanted to help kids that were in the same situation that I was in. And uh, everything was going great uh, at first, but then my grades just tanked and it didn't matter what I did. And I actually ended up flunking out of physical therapy school. And I was really bummed out about that. and I got on the elevator to go back home and uh, I, I told I asked God you know what now that was gonna be that was gonna be my livelihood and, and now I don't know what to do and as clear as day he said I want you to preach the gospel um, I didn't uh, there was no other instruction other than that but while all this is going on he's also leading me to start a ministry for people with disabilities and at first I was not gonna do it because I was thinking there's no way that uh, that uh, they were going to let some 19-year-old kid uh, start a ministry, and I told I, I I remember praying. I said, God, if you want me to do this, you're going to have to put a bow on it and uh, show me that you want me to do this. Because if you don't, I'm not going to do it. I prayed that prayer on a Thursday. That Sunday, I walk into church and I strike up a conversation with one of the church members. Um, and it wasn't anything spectacular, but at the end of the conversation, he said, you know what? I think you ought to start a ministry for people with disabilities. I think you'd be really good at it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, that was my bow. And, uh, and he had no idea that I had prayed that, that prayer beforehand. And, uh, and, and God has just blessed the ministry. We've had wonderful opportunities to start like national partnerships and, and things like that. Um, but, and I know it sounds like I'm rambling on, but there's a method to my madness that Moses said, I, I can't do what you've called me to do mm. because of my physical challenge. But that is not the case. Uh, the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10, uh, he had this thorn in his flesh that he prayed to God three different times to remove. And God said, no, my grace is sufficient for you, and my power is made perfect in weakness. Uh, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest in me. That is why I take delight in infirmities, in persecutions, in hardships, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And so I can honestly stand here and tell you today that cerebral palsy has been the greatest blessing of my life because it's given me opportunities to share the gospel and, and dig deeper into what God has, has called me to do and preach the gospel. And Romans chapter 10, verse 15 says, uh, uh, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Even the feet that are disfigured and crippled can preach the gospel. Um, and so my, my big challenge for you is you want to know how you can see, you can witness God's power in your life. Stop making excuses mm. and give him your weaknesses. Yes. When, when you do that, 
God will do exceedingly, abundantly, above what you could even think or imagine. And uh, the, the, the things that I have, have, have been blessed to experience, the people that I've gotten to meet, a lot of that would not have happened if I did not have cerebral palsy. God works all things for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And uh, he really does work it all out for his good. And what we need is not a generation of Christians who are going to make excuses as to why they can't do something. You have the God of the universe on your side. Mm -hmm. He created everything with just a word. He spoke exist. He spoke the universe into existence. And so what, what I want us to do today is if you have anything that you're battling in your life, any sort of weakness, any, any hindrance or excuse that you're, you're trying to make as to why you can't step out in faith and do what God has called you to do, uh, lay it down at the feet of Jesus because the last thing that Moses tells God, the last, he doesn't even make an excuse. All he says is no. No. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against him because God chose Moses. He didn't want to choose anybody else, although he could. He didn't want to. And so would you just surrender your weaknesses to him today? Let's would you would you all stand if you want to come forward and kneel? You can. But man surrender your weaknesses to God. Don't pretend to be strong because that's not, that's not what being a born again Christian is about. Uh, Jesus, uh, it's called the, the kenosis. He emptied himself of, he, he gave up his, 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 his throne in heaven. He became weak, frail human flesh and dwelt among us. And so if Jesus can do that, then you can bring him your weaknesses and hardships and hindrances, and you can walk in victory and complete what God has called you to do, whatever it may be. No more excuses. All right? Let's pray. And uh, if, if you'd like, you can repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I give you my weakness. I, I, I give it to you so that you can use it for your glory. Lord, if you don't take away the thorn, you're going to use it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.